Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight, and I want to thank the audience for coming out on a rainy evening to hear our story about Hurricane Harvey. Uh, certainly is a very topical uh, subject at this moment with Florence coming ashore in North Carolina today. So uh, I wanted to talk with you about the flood emergency response that was involved with Hurricane Harvey because I was engaged with that at our state operations center here in Austin. I want to discuss some of the research that we've been engaged in. And I want to thank the people who've worked with me uh, on this research. Uh, uh, let me just go back. There's the National Weather Service, the Texas Division of Emergency Management, uh, Mike Wiemet, Jing Jing, David Arctor, Harry Evans, Eric Bogic, uh, Paul Pasolacqua, who's here, and some firms, Kistas, Esri, and the US Geological Survey. So I want to deal with these four subjects, Hurricane Harvey and then a little bit about Florence because it's topical for today, about how flood forecasting is done and how a new system is emerging, uh, about a Texas flood response system that we've worked on with the Texas Division of Emergency Management, and then I want to ask some questions at the end, how can we do better? How can we be more resilient in our state? So first of all, Hurricane Harvey, and let me start with Florence. So these are pictures that I captured from the National Hurricane Center starting on Tuesday. This was the forecast for Hurricane Florence, and uh, it was coming in from the Atlantic Ocean at that time. The M means a major hurricane with winds that are greater than 110 miles an hour, and then H means a regular hurricane, uh, S and D are storms. So this was as it was forecast on Tuesday coming ashore in North Carolina. Then on Wednesday, there was a, uh, an idea that this was going to turn south, actually come on to perhaps in, even come ashore in South Carolina. Uh, and then on Thursday, as it got closer and closer, you can see now the idea where it's going to come on shore is pretty well known, and the pattern is being laid out as to where it's going to go after it comes on shore. And then today, uh, it actually made landfall at 7.15 in the morning uh, at, in Wilmington, North Carolina. And you can see there's a ex tra expected track here that the hurricane is going to uh, follow afterwards. Now, what we've been doing in our research is trying to understand what happens once these hurricanes get ashore and really what's underneath this big uh, 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 map that you see here with, of the hurricane path. Now, this is the equivalent uh, path data for Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey was different. So what you see here on the bottom is a chart showing the intensity of the hurricane as a function of time. Uh, Harvey came ashore on Friday evening, the 25th of August, actually this, uh, about a bit later than this, uh, two weeks ago and then a year ago. Uh, it was then a Category 4 hurricane with winds of 130 miles an hour. It came ashore in Rockport, Texas, just east of Corpus Christi. Uh, then it went inland, then it wandered out to the ocean again. And it went along in the ocean for, in the Gulf for quite a while, then it came ashore again in Beaumont. So what made Harvey different uh, then Florence was that it came ashore as a Category 4 hurricane and then it left and came ashore again as a tropical storm and there was five days in between. So for those five days, Harvey was out in the Gulf and it was sweeping water in over the state. In the picture that you can see on the top right hand corner here, uh, the big centre is where the hurricane's coming ashore and the other centre is actually over Houston where the rain was falling, started falling on Saturday and it just kept on going. So the thing that was really striking about Harvey was how long the hurricane lasted for. And when you think about hurricanes, you think about rainfall coming from the sky. Well, of course, rain has to come from the sky, otherwise we're not going to get flooding. We think about inundation from rivers. Uh, in this case, the picture I show is where a levee has failed. And we think about coastal storm surge, which is what's going on now uh, in North and South Carolina. Now, what made Harvey different was that because the rain lasted so long, this idea of the rainfall from the sky as the primary cause of flooding uh, was the characteristic of Harvey. It wasn't flooding from the rivers, it wasn't the coastal storm surge, but rather simply the rains, the heavens opened and the rain fell down over a long, long period of time. And that was what made Harvey such a, a memorable storm. Indeed, Statistics have been compiled for uh, previous storm events that are shown by these blue dots and for Harvey, which is the orange line. And the vertical axis here is the amount of rainfall, the depth of rainfall, and the horizontal axis is the area of the storm. So the idea of this chart is it's looking at the maximum rain that happened uh, over a given storm area uh, during Harvey. And 
Harvey, for two days precipitation, was the worst recorded storm in US history. For three days, Harvey had five inches more rainfall than any previous storm that's ever happened in the country. And for five days, which is the chart that you see here, Harvey averaged 11 inches more than the previous worst storm. So in other words, if you take the difference between the blue dots and the orange line there, and just average that over the different areas that are shown, that's 11 inches. Now we would think of 11 inches as a catastrophe in its own right here in Texas for a storm. That's the uh, memorial floods that we've, uh, the floods that we've had here of like 11 inches. This was 11 inches on top of the worst storms that have ever happened in the history of the nation. So this is the benchmark. It's called the probable maximum precipitation in engineering terms. Now how do we manage this kind of an emergency? So we have a uh, Department of Public Safety within which there's a Texas Division of Emergency Management uh, and this is Chief Kidd, he's the uh, leader of the Texas Division of Emergency Management. And the state is divided up into these six regions for bringing resources to uh, disaster hit regions. Those six districts in, are in, in turn divided up into these disaster areas here that you see that are coloured in. And then those are themselves made up of counties. So what happens during a disaster is that cities and counties request re resources, those requests come up through the disaster districts, they're coordinated at the regions, and then they're coordinated finally at the state level. And for Harvey, the big impact was in region two, which is the area uh, in southeast Texas that contains uh, Houston. Now this is the State Operations Center in Austin. It's uh, two floors down below the Department of Public Safety building at the corner um, of uh, Lamar and uh, 2222. Uh, and the, when it's in full operation as it was during Harvey, there's about 120 people down in this bunker. It's actually got uh, uh, concrete steel construction so it can survive a nuclear hit on the capital and the state can still function. Uh, and what you see on the lower picture here is the briefing that was presented each day at the State Operations Centre as to the projected weather conditions and the purple uh, across the bottom of the chart there shows flooding, extreme flooding expected for the next five days. Now this is a very large operation and there are thousands of people involved. Uh, there are hundreds of uh, aircraft and helicopters, there's trucks and vehicles all over the, all over the state. This is, so this is the nerve centre for the whole operation uh, for Harvey. And in Harvey there was a death toll of 80 people. Now I don't want to minimise anybody's death because it's a tragedy, everyone individually, but it is isn't 1800. So this was a pretty well managed disaster. Katrina was 1800 and there's a feeling in the emergency response community that they don't want to be caught like they were in Katrina uh, and having an inadequate response. Uh, we came in on Tuesday morning, I was at the State Operations Centre for 10 days and on Tuesday they came in and said oh, 26 inches of rain fell on Beaumont last night. Beaumont is now Venice and by that point all the urban search and rescue teams from across the country were in Texas and there was just an all-out assault on Beaumont and Port Arthur. And the airspace above the cities was completely filled with helicopters. Small ones picking people up uh, on, the, on the winch like you see here, and then large ones like the Chinooks on the left-hand side that were carrying the people from uh, the smaller helicopters and shipping them off to other cities that weren't damaged by the flood. Uh, but this was a, a tremendous operation uh, that was undertaken in Beaumont, Port Arthur. Another thing that was important was the damage to uh, residential buildings in Houston. And these are some data that I just got recently uh, from the city of Houston. The flood covered 64% of the area of the city of Houston. And the yellow is the flooded buildings and the blue is the mapped flood zone. And if you look at the number of buildings that were flooded and uh, see where they were, 23% of them were inside the 100 year flood zone, which is a risk zone that's flooded once, or on average, one percent per year. Uh, Nineteen percent were between 100 and 500 year flood zone, and 58 percent were outside any flood zone. Uh, that's a bit of a sobering statistic when you think about the amount of effort that we go to to define where flood risk is. So m more than half of the flooded buildings in Houston, and that's because Harvey was a rain uh, event, a huge rain event. The rain just fell out of the sky and it had nowhere to go. So now I want to talk about flood forecasting and how we go about doing that. 
And the system that's, uh, that's been in place for uh, quite a long time is shown here. These different colored areas represent uh, the flood forecast regions of different river forecast centers operated by the National Weather Service. And the little honeycomb uh, shapes that you see there are forecast basins. And these are area, areas where the National Weather Service forecasts the flow at the outlet of that basin. There's about 580 of those in Texas. And our forecast system is based in, in Fort Worth. It's called the West Gulf River Forecast Center. And these forecasts are for generally for 48 to 72 hours ahead um, on the main rivers. Now, an opportunity emerged several years ago to think about this in a new way. So a new national water center was established on the Tuscaloosa campus of the University of Alabama by the National Weather Service and by federal agency partners like the US Geological Survey and others. And it has a mission to assess hydrology in a new way at a continental scale for the United States. And so the intent is that there would be a uh, centralized flood forecasting system for the country that would interact with the regional forecast centers, much like the National Hurricane Center is for hurricanes. So there'll be a flood center for a bit in Tuscaloosa. And so this is still spinning up. It's taken quite a while to do that. Uh, but to do that, you have to have a, now a flood model that works across the whole country and not just for a particular region. So I participated in the first uh, scientific meeting that was held at the National Water Centre, which was in May of 2014. And you can see this is a Taj Mahal kind of a building. Uh, it's actually really gorgeous. They say, you know, Google in Alabama or something. And why Tuscaloosa? Thank you, Senator Shelby. It's his hometown. Uh, what can you say? Is this a great country or what? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but being Sen chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee is really good for the National Water Centre. Uh, so I saw this big building and somebody said, how many people can this building hold? And they said, 200. And then they said, well, how many people are going to be here a year from now? And they said, well, maybe 50 or you know, sort of an awkward silence like, whoa, you know, you've got this huge building and I'm not going to have too many people in it. So I thought, well, you could regard that as a problem or you could regard that as an opportunity. So that night I sent a long message to the director of the National Water Centre and said, uh, let's bring in the academic community and rapidly prototype a new national flood forecasting system in one year, just crash it out, you know, just do our crazy academic thing. Uh, and I said at the end of this, if you think this is too nutty, uh, just you know, put it in the garbage can and I'm not going to be personally insulted, but that's not what happened. They had all their management there, they put it up on the big board and they thought about it for a while and said, okay, we'll go for it. And so uh, we got engaged and since that time there's been annual summer institutes for graduate students, about 130 students from 50 universities have been to the National Water Centre helping to build the National Water Model. And this is coordinated by an organisation called QUASI, the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science. Now, we built the prototype of the National Water Model here in Austin and we used geographic information systems. And this is my research uh, speciality. Uh, and these are data sets that have been developed across the country for elevation to describe the surface topography of the nation, for hydrography, which is the Blue Line rivers, for the watershed boundaries, the area around drainage uh, units, and for the national land cover uh, data set. Uh, it took about 10 years to develop those data sets. It took 10 more years to bring them together so that you connect the land and water systems of the country. So what is now existing is a whole series of 2.7 million little units, reach catchments they're called, and the average area of those is three square kilometers and the average length of the streams in them is two kilometers and they're uniquely labeled. So you've got these little postage stamp size pieces of land, each piece of land is connected to a water stream and then you do that across the whole nation and you connect the water bodies to one another and that way you can uh, model the flow across the country. And this happens to be one of these little catchments. It's uh, near Lake Travis on Frit Fritz Hughes Park Road. And it happened that uh, in August of 2014, a sheriff's deputy, uh, Jessica Hollis, drove down that low water crossing there at two o'clock in the morning to visit an isolated community and she got washed off and she was drowned. And it just seemed you know, such a tragic thing. And you know, here she's 35 years old, she had two sons. I mean, 3,000 people came to her funeral. And, if she'd had better information in the truck, you know, dun, dun, don't go there. It, her life could have been saved. And you know, this is for a little obscure catchment in the 
far out rural parts of Travis County. This is not just for the city, this is for the rural areas as well. We built the prototype of the national water model here in Stampede, uh, in the Texas Advanced uh, Computing Center. Uh, it's a very impressive computer uh, equipment that you see here. And that tank is right outside my office, 1.2 million gallons cooling tank that cools Stampede on hot uh, summer afternoons. Uh, this is now the largest academic uh, supercomputer in the country. And on Stampede, we built the prototype of this, uh, which is the national water model. So what you see here is all the rivers and streams uh, of the continental United States, 2.7 million of them. Uh, and this is a simulation for three months during the summer of 2015. Uh, we had some severe floods like right now, that 528, 529 is when the big flood went down the Blanco River. Uh, and you see sort of like a blood flow of the nation here. The, the big um, orange line coming down through the middle is the Mississippi River. Uh, the, on the left hand side at the bottom of Texas we've got the Rio Grande. Uh, to the left of that is the Colorado. Up in the top left is the Columbia River system. Uh, so this is now the simulation system for water for the nation. And it runs um, in the uh, National Weather Service's operational supercomputer system in Washington and starting in August of 2016. So now the nation has a weather forecasting system and in the corner of that there's a water forecasting system that's connected to that. And here in Austin this means Waller Creek, Shoal Creek, Walnut Creek, all these local creeks are included in the national water model. So it's an amazing uh, accomplishment actually to have that the federal government has achieved that. And this is a simulation that was done uh, for Hurricane Harvey. So on the left hand side is a 10 days ahead forecast from when Harvey was out in the Gulf uh, and then as it penetrated inland and the colours that you see are the amount of rainfall. And the right hand side is what actually happened. Uh, and so it's pretty amazing that when the Harvey was out in the Gulf at uh, about three days out here, this simulation was started on the Tuesday, Harvey came ashore on Friday, that it was feasible to look ahead and to be able to uh, anticipate where the hurricane was going to go and where the big uh, rainfall effects were going to be. Uh, and this was a, a capacity to think about what goes underneath the hurricane forecast that you see on the, uh, from the National Hurricane Centre that just has never existed before. So during Harvey, we were at the State Operations Centre and it was incredibly, incredibly tense. I just, I can't even describe how tense it is. People speak quietly because they don't, they just want to keep themselves under control. Uh, the person who was in charge of urban search and rescue, his nickname was Country. Uh, his real name was Warren Widelam and I had a nickname, my name was Doc. And so one day I went past Country's office and he just fixed me with like a thousand yard stare. And he said, Doc, we need data. And it was one of those like no fluff moments, you know, this is, this is serious. So that night, the director of the Texas Division of Emergency Management sent the president of the university a letter and said, you know, we need help. We'd been working with the Texas Division of Emergency Management on developing a new flood forecast and adaptation system for the state, and they wanted some help with that. So what is that system that we were working on? It's called the Texas uh, Flood Response System. So, in a number of places in the country, there are um, maps that you see like this. This happens to be Onion Creek at Highway 183. The little green dot is a gauging station uh, uh, measuring flow that's put there by the US Geological Survey. And so for different water levels, on Onion Creek at Highway 183, as the water goes up and down, you can see the water level rising and falling uh, and covering a certain area upstream and downstream of that gauge, but only there. So after we got going with the national water model, we, I thought now, why couldn't we do that for the whole country, rather than just for a small area upstream and downstream of a gauging station? And similarly, at each gauging station, there's a chart called a rating curve that relates the water level in the river to the discharge of the river or the amount of flow in the river. And so I thought, well, why couldn't we do that for the whole country too, so that we're forecasting the flow or the discharge with the national water model, and we can infer what the water level will be. Another thing that we did was to uh, go around the state and collect up all the address points. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but every building has a dot on the top of it in the emergency um, response system. So if you make a call and say, come to my house, I need help, 
then what the dispatcher is seeing is a little dot, and it says police go there, EMS go there, fire go there. And we have 355,000 of these dots in Travis County. There are 9.28 million of them for taxes. And so we went around the state to all emergency communications districts and gathered them together because this tells you where people are. And then we decided to uh, develop a very simplified method of ma mapping floods called the height above nearest drainage. And it just says, I'm at a certain location near a creek and the height above nearest drainage or the height that I am above the bottom of the creek is, uh, is called hand. If the water level is normal, it's below that, I'm okay. If it's above that, I'm going to get flooded. And so we computed a map of this value of hand for the whole continental United States. We did that on a supercomputer system at the University of Illinois called Roger. And so what we did was to take the discharge and then convert it to depth uh, using a rating curve, then the depth of inundation using the hand uh, mapping, and then the, the inundation mapping to the impact by intersecting with the address points. And this is a calculation that I made at 3 o'clock uh, on the night that Harvey came ashore. So Harvey came ashore about 10 o'clock on Friday night, uh, and we made a calculation through this Texas flood response system that Region 2 was going to get 238,000 addresses flooded. Region 6, which is next door, which we are contained in, would be 20,000, and so on. You can see smaller numbers. Uh, so I knew before the hurricane got to the coast that Houston was going to get creamed. And when I look at it now, I think that we could have made this assessment while the hurricane was still out in the Gulf. When, I, when you look at that simulation that I showed, and this is the first time that this kind of assessment has even been possible. That the concept that you can anticipate where damage will be and how large it's going to be before the hurricane even gets to the coast, actually. Now, this is just one data point. Uh, you'd have to test all this and more hurricanes to be sure, but uh, it's still uh, it's a big accomplishment, I think. Now, it happens that after the hurricane was over, the number of buildings that were damaged and reported to the Texas Division of Emergency Management was 152,800. At the time I made the calculation before the hurricane got to the coast, I said that the top uh, five counties in damage were going to be Harris, Fort Bend, Brazoria, Galveston, and Montgomery. And it turned out that they were really Harris, Orange, Fort Bend, Montgomery, and Jefferson. And Orange and Jefferson counties are near Beaumont, Port Arthur, where the big storm happened right at the end of the hurricane. So it's, yeah, we, we knew where the big damage was going to happen. And what's remarkable about that is that the hurricane came ashore in Corpus Christi, 165 miles to the southwest of the Houston area. And the chart that you see here, the orange is, shows the actual percentage of the damage according to the different regions of the state, and the blue is what was forecast. And you can see the big bar is in the Houston area, and we got it almost exactly right. Uh, and also you can see the little... Uh, blip there, the orange blip at three, that means region three, that's in Corpus Christi, and that's the wind damage that happened in the uh, coastal bend area. And you can see the proportion of the total damage in the hurricane was very small for wind compared with flood. Flood dominated everything. 95% of the damage in Harvey was from flood and not from wind, although the wind did take off the top of the condominium building that the, our apartment was in in Port Aransas, which meant we uh, experienced this personally. <laughs> So now, let me finish up by raising some questions about how can we do better? How can we make our, stud, our state more resilient? Uh, this is a remarkable thing that happened on Facebook. Uh, there was a Facebook page opened up for Harvey right as the hurricane uh, started, and it has 121,000 members now, and it's still pretty active. I, I checked it this morning. There's people still corresponding about Harvey on this Facebook page, 121,000 members. They put up a map and they say, I need rescue. <laughs> so the blue dots here are 5,000 reports of I need rescue. Uh, the purple dots here are people making calls to the 311 system. And you can see there's a lot of I need rescue calls over in the Beaumont Port Arthur area, which is resulting from the, uh, the storm that happened there. So this is an area where I think we can really improve is somehow integrating with uh, social media here. This was so, I mean, can you imagine 5,300 calls to a 911 system, like, I need help. Uh, somehow we, we can do better if we can integrate with this kind of a system. Another thing is that uh, there are 27,000 bridges on 15,700 stream reaches that the National Water Model forecasts. So if you want to sample uh, and measure in a really dense way water in our state, then using the bridges is an obvious way to do it. 
And some new technologies are becoming available uh, using radar for measuring water level and also measuring the surface velocity. And so we've been trying to say, OK, densified forecasting, like we're doing with the National Water Model, requires densified measurement. And so the Texas Department of Transportation has said, OK, yeah, we'll, we'll help you. And so this is the first uh, phase of what I hope will be more. This is an instrumentation on I-10 uh, from San Antonio to the Louisiana border. We're going to put 20 of these radar sensors that you saw and use them to examine the flood security of I-10. And if you think about the interstate system, it goes horizontally, it goes vertically across the country. If you want to have a scientific sampling system for measuring water, the interstate system is a pretty good place to do it. So thank you, Texas Department of Transportation. Um, another thing that we've worked on in our research here is a language for communicating water data called WaterML. It's like the HTML, but it's for water. And this is a chart, the US Geological Survey, that uh, measures water at about 7,000 locations in the state, in the country. Um, has adopted this language. And uh, it, at the bottom there, you see a time that says 2018 that's today, the 14th of September 2018, at 10.50 this morning, that's this morning. Minus 05500 means it's five hours before uh, Greenwich Mean Time. And the flow in the Colorado River at Austin was 136 cubic feet per second. So by repeating those kinds of signals, time value, time value, time value, time value, you get the chart that you see above. And indeed, this is how we measure water. We have a time series of precipitation and stream flow and water levels and other things. The US Geological Survey has made this a 24-7-365 service for the country. And this is now the international standard language for transmitting water resources time series across the Earth. And this is my home country, New Zealand. You may wonder about the interesting accent. Uh, and they have 16 regional agencies uh, and a national agency that collect water data at about 1,000 stations. And they have implemented the WaterML language. And they've succeeded in building a national synthesis of their information without centralizing the data. So they don't have to have all the data going to Wellington, which is the capital. All the observation systems have a mechanism for communicating on top of them that's in common. So in New Zealand, they can look at their whole observation system as a single system, even though under the hood, there are many different systems involved in that. Now let's imagine what that could be like here in Texas. So in Austin, the city of Austin has its own flood alert system. There's actually 44 locations where they measure water level and more where they measure precipitation uh, that the city of Austin runs by itself. In addition to that, we have gauges by the Lower Colorado River Authority that are mainly um, on the main rivers here, the Colorado River and its tributaries. There are gauges by the US Geological Survey um, on other rivers. Now let's imagine that those things are all now communicating in the same language, this water ML language, so that we have a harmonized water information system for the Austin area. And all of it is accessible in a uniform way rather than being separate systems as it is now. And it would be helpful also if we could build up a whole flood alert system for our state. So we have about 500 US Geological Survey gauges and they measure everything. It's the gold standard. As we saw, the Texas Department of Transportation has now started putting sensors on bridges. That's not as good as the gold standard because it's mainly for medium and high flows, not for low flows, but it's still helpful. And then lots of local communities like Austin and Hayes County and others uh, collect uh, data in local flood alert systems. And it would be great if we could bring all that together and have a single system across the whole state using data services. And the, the attractive part about that is that it isn't expensive. It's pretty cheap to do this because you're just adding a language on top of the existing measurement systems. So let me conclude then by saying what happened during Harvey. For three to five days duration, uh, Harvey was the uh, largest rainfall in US history. Uh, what did we learn? Uh, we learned that it's possible, uh, using the Texas flood response system, to accurately forecast the spatial pattern of the damage before the hurricane made landfall. I don't think anybody even knew that before. And where to from here? Uh, I think we need a better connection with social media, and I'd like to see this internet of water for Texas, using the water markup language to make uh, a real-time flood alert system for our whole state. So thank you very much. Thank you for that fantastic lecture and presentation, Dr. Maidment. Um, so 
We are very fortunate tonight. Uh, we get to understand the flooding events and Harvey in particular through the lens of multiple perspectives. And we're, we're beginning with one of the most advanced world leaders in terms of the engineering knowledge and how we manage and use technology to interact and analyze our data sets rapidly and correctly and accurately so that it's useful information. So we take that information and we turn it into knowledge. But we also have Sarah Labowitz who's going to be joining us today. Yep, come on up. <laughs> and, and then we're also going to have Melissa Huffman. So I'll ask you both to come on up and I'll give you, um, I'll give you a couple of uh, introductions. And David, would you like to join us here on the, on the panel? So let me start by introducing um, Melissa. <coughs> so as, as she crosses the stage, Melissa Huffman uh, is actually a meteorologist, believe it or not. She has a degree in meteorology from Nebraska, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And in addition to that, she has a master's in public affairs um, in emergency management from University of Northern Texas. Um, she actually works as a lead meteorologist today um, for the National Weather Service, and she's currently based um, in Austin and San Antonio. But she has worked major events already for the state of Texas. She previously worked in the Midland and Galveston area, and she also worked in Houston. Um, she worked on some events that will be familiar to you all. She worked for the Memorial Day flood of 2015, and she also worked on the Tax Day flood of 2016. Anyone remember those? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so she's had a great deal of experience, and one of the questions that I'm going to ask, this is actually probably the hardest question of the evening, is I'd like for you to tell us a little bit, Melissa, about your work on Harvey, and also can you tell us exactly what a hurricane is? Okay, I'll, um, I'll start with what a hurricane is first. Uh, oh. <laughs> getting really excited here. Uh, so when you're thinking about a hurricane, um, a lot of times when you're watching the news or maybe checking the weather online, you'll hear about meteorologists referring to low pressure systems. And a hurricane is just a type of low pressure system. But what really distinguishes it from the kinds that we see in the fall and winter and spring that bring cold fronts through the area is that there are no fronts associated with hurricanes. Hurricanes are really these low pressure systems, basically showers and thunderstorms surrounding some kind of center that develop in the tropical Atlantic or tropical Pacific. Um, and as you know, things have been really active lately because Florence making landfall this morning and we've been keeping an eye obviously on our disturbance that's been down off the lower Texas coast. Uh, so we're in the middle of hurricane season, but a hurricane just in its most simplistic form is that area of low pressure it's a, it's a closed center uh, surrounded by showers and thunderstorms uh, with winds in excess of 74 miles an hour. Now, sometimes when you hear about uh, tropical weather, you'll hear about tropical storms or depressions. And really, when you hear those different classifications, it's just the how strong the observed winds are with that system. That's what really makes the distinction between a depression, a storm, and a hurricane. Well, can you tell us a little bit about what happened when Harvey hit, and where were you, and what did you do in your role? Yes, so I am now in the Austin San Antonio National Weather Service office. Uh, I just got here though, so you guys are getting me a month in, so I'm learning South Central Texas, and I would love to talk to you if you have any tips about the area. Uh, but I came from the Houston Galveston office, and I was there for four years, and so the, the big final event that I worked there uh, really was Harvey. Um, we went to kind of like how Dr. Maidman was talking about how he went to the SOC the Tuesday before uh, the hurricane uh, moved into the Western Gulf. Uh, we actually began, uh, the National Weather Service is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Weather doesn't take a break, so we don't take a break. Uh, but we moved to a 12-hour staffing schedule. Um, so we either had the night shift or the day shift, and that started uh, the Wednesday before Harvey uh, moved into um, the, the Corpus area. Um, so before landfall, it made landfall on a Friday. <clears throat> and so we each had basically battle stations. Uh, so everyone had their designated role. 
Um, so whether you were radar, whether you were working on the actual tropical forecast, whether you were working on uh, media interactions, um, we try to push out a lot of information to the media since that's who everyone's turning to to get information during a hurricane. So we had staffed these battle stations to push out information. Um, and then you kind of have this personal aspect too because you realize that you're about to, to go through this event just like everyone else. So we had a lot of uh, family preparations that needed to be made. Um, you know, making sure your home was gonna be okay. Um, figuring out what you were gonna do with pets, all those preparedness things that you have to go through for a hurricane. And then the biggest thing for me was just getting prepared to stay at work for an extended period of time. So all of our staff actually ended up sleeping at the office. Um, and if you want a really good way to get to know your coworkers, <laughs> seeing them in their pajamas will do it for you. Bring a toothbrush. Uh, uh, but we all, I think the person who stayed at the work the longest, um, it was a seven day stint, um, and we actually had one of our entry level meteorologists who it was her first week at work, and so she got to live at work for her first week, and that was, wow. that was a lot. Wow, welcome to the team, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, in addition, in, and from a different perspective, Sarah Labowitz is with us. She has actually also had a prior career before she started working with hurricane and extreme events. She um, worked for the US Department of State and um, interestingly, she was the co-founder of the NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. So she comes to um, extreme events with a very different perspective, much more of a social and community-driven perspective on things. And so currently, she's the communications and policy director for the city of Houston in the housing and community development department. So imagine what she gets to interact with and think about all the time, which you're gonna tell us about. Um, one of the tidbits that's very interesting about Sarah's background in relation to Harvey is that Sarah ran the mega center at the George R. Brown Convention Center. A piece of it, I did not run the whole center. There you go. Yeah. That's very, yeah. <laughs> well tell us about that piece. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened yeah. for you and what was your perspective on Harvey um, and your experience with Harvey and then also, I have another question for you after you know. Well, um, do we have any Houstonians in the house? Okay. Wow. Oh, all right. So um, I imagine some of you were in Houston at the time of Harvey. I had moved to Houston about uh, two months before Harvey and had never really experienced extreme weather um, and had gotten to know a group of people, including a guy named Tom McCasland, who is the housing director for the city of Houston. So he runs the housing department. And uh, I was on a a text chain with some friends, and my house was okay. This was on uh, Sunday. Uh, remember when we saw the, the days of the storm? So it started raining in Houston on Saturday night, and Sunday my house looked good. And I texted my friend Tom and I said, hey, I hear that you're standing up a shelter at the convention center. Do you need any help? And he just texted back, yes, come down. <laughs> and um, I, at this point, it was still raining, and I wasn't. Ex I live about two miles from downtown in the and the convention center. So on Monday morning, I, I put on my running shoes and a running hat, and um, took a little bag with me and a, a waterproof jacket, and I started jogging uh, to get down there because I couldn't drive my car. And uh, pretty soon, the roads were pretty deserted, but a, a a big jeep pulled up. I sort of flagged him down. He said, "Hey, you need a ride." And I was like, yeah. So uh, it turns out that he had been, um, we saw the, the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. He was on Facebook and identifying people who needed rescue. And he had been out uh, basically for 24 hours just on a volunteer basis. He was a guy with a Jeep. And he drove around the city of Houston uh, pulling people to high water. So that was how I got down to the George R. Brown. And I didn't know what was gonna happen. But it turns out they really needed volunteers and um, Harvey was so big and affected so many people that the sheltering needs were much bigger than anyone had anticipated. And usually in a disaster, you want a series of small shelters that are close to where people live. But in Harvey, those kept getting washed out. So everybody started to come down to the George R. Brown in the central part of Houston, and all of a sudden, the city had to stand up a shelter that on Monday night had 10,000 people sleeping in it. And not just 10,000 people, but their cats and dogs and rabbits and ferrets and turtles. Um, so uh, 
that was that became my I was there very early on as the systems were getting stood up and uh, sometimes when you are there at the very beginning you you stay for a long time and so I was there for about two weeks um, I went home at, t at times but um, but we were a group of mostly um, volunteers and then augmented over the several days by more and more professional staff we were very happy to see the professionals show up um, but that was that was my first and very dramatic experience with disaster. Wow, that's an experience. Those are some memories right there, for sure, and some, some rich experiences. So I'm looking at Slido, and I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions for Slido. There are so many good questions, it's hard for me to figure out which ones to ask, but I'm gonna turn to David quickly and ask. I'm going to combine a question from Rich and a question from JP together into one question. Um, so people are wondering, uh, what the differences are between the flood prediction models that you're discussing today and the things that we see on the local news weather forecasts and, and also then how the heck, what are the technologies that you're using um, to process and visualize this information? So <clears throat> what's different is that we're aiming to have a, a flood map on the ground continuously everywhere all the time. That's what underlies the research that we're doing with the Texas flood response system. And the technologies that we're using to visualize um, all of this, well, geographic information systems are used for depicting the flood mapping. Uh, that's a major factor. But a key thing is the supercomputing center uh, here in Austin and also what the National Weather Service uses in Washington at the, and at the National Water Center. So I think of like the difference between a regular computer, a laptop computer, and a supercomputer is like the phone to a laptop to supercomputer. And I'd never worked with supercomputing before I started with Harvey. But when we made the prototype of the national water model, we were able to show that we could calculate the flow in all the rivers and streams in the country in 10 minutes. One calculation for the whole country in 10 minutes. I mean, nobody knew that before. I didn't even know that, and I proposed it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, it, it's, what's happened is, you know, this is the era of big data and big computing, and we've figured out how to harness that for, for flooding. Yeah, harnessing this big data revol revolution that's happening is very intriguing. I have a similar situation with my data sets that it was taking me 17 hours to um, process one piece of information on my laptop. Um, and I had 14,400 points of data over 20 years. And I took it to TAC, to the supercomputing center, and it processed everything, every single piece of information in under nine minutes. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, big computers, good. Um, so one of the other uh, questions that I wanna ask about, because there were some questions here, there's a question from John, and um, they're, they're wondering, um, you know, Hurricane Florence is coming in, and uh, they're wondering, you know, how are the modeling uh, results holding up so far, and also um, did we anticipate you know, flooding in places like New Bern. And that really leads to a question I have here for Melissa, which is, how do you prepare? We've got more information. We've got a lot of uncertainty in some of this information. And there are new tools, like the ones that Dr. Maidman is developing. And so how do you decide what to tell people in advance of these events? That's a lot of questions. Do you want to talk about some of the modeling for Florence? No, go, go ahead, Melissa. OK. Uh, talk amongst yourselves too. Right. <laughs> Coffee talk, a little discussion. Um, so in terms of, uh, we'll talk multi-hazard messaging and then preparedness. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, for my Houstonians who are in here, um, you probably were at one point in time or several points in time during Harvey ready to hit your phone with a hammer or your alarm system because you were getting tornado warnings, you were getting flash flood warnings, and you were probably like, I get it. I know that th things are bad outside. I get it. This is the fourth day of this. Um, and that really becomes a, a huge problem is, you know, we were under a tornado watch continuously in Harvey for, I think it was at least 60 hours. Uh, you're under flash flood watches. You have this long duration event um, and you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, the bottom floor of my home is flooded, and, but I now just got this tornado warning. So if I'm supposed to seek the lowest level of my home, but now there's a tornado, what do I really do? And, and so that's one of the things that we've really been taking a look at at the National Weather Service because we recognize that, 
you know, it would be really great if you only had one hazard in a hurricane, but you don't. Um, if you live along the coast, there's surge. If you live inland, you can have uh, fresh water flooding. Um, there's also wind concerns. Uh, and then there's the tornado threat. And so what we're trying to do is to figure out how we can better prioritize. What is the biggest threat at that point of time? The thing that, you know, we're going back through and, and we're looking at the data from Harvey, um, Really, unless you lived in the Cyprus area, most of the tornadoes that occurred during Harvey were actually fairly weak. So maybe more on the end of producing um, fence damage or knocking over a trash can, um, as opposed to the flooding, where if you went out in that, you were risking the chemicals that could have been in the floodwaters, fire ants, electrocution. That was one of the fatalities that we saw during Harvey was someone who entered the floodwaters and was electrocuted. So it's figuring out how do we message that, say yes, there is this tornado threat here, but the flash flood threat is better, or, or is, is, is higher, it's, it's more severe. Um, and so in, I know the Houston office is working on flash flood messaging with the city of Houston, with Harris County, to go how do we better promote this flash flood threat, acknowledging that there are other hazards there, but when flooding is, is the thing that's out there, how do we make sure that all of our different agencies are saying the same thing? Hopefully that got That's, the yeah, question. Yeah, and I'll, I'll follow up quickly and just and ask. Um, so in, in, with Florence right now, Dr. Maidman, what do you think? Uh, are, are things looking like the modeling is pretty accurate, and do you feel like they're getting the right messages out? Well, about the messaging, I'm not sure. That's Melissa's thing. But, um, <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was impressed by the forecasting that was done by the West Gulf River Forecast Center. They did a pretty good job of forecasting the major flows on the rivers. And the National Water Model did a pretty good job of being able to track sort of the mass effect across the landscape, right, not just in specific points in the rivers. And uh, I, that's, those uh, things, I think, are going to stand up well in Florence as well. The Southeast River Forecast Centre is the one that does the forecasting for that area of the country. It's going to be interesting. We're going to learn a lot. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to understanding what's happening with those biophysical systems and with the water itself, the next question really is, is one that I'm, I'm going um, to turn to Sarah to ask, which is, um, Okay, people come streaming into shelters, people are evacuating. Um, what are the kinds of things that make some people more vulnerable or susceptible to the risks? And also, um, how is that impacted in terms of social structure or what can you tell us about what that means about our communities? So we saw the map earlier that, that Harvey hit 64% of the geographic area in the city of Houston was underwater. And it really, you often hear it described as an equal opportunity storm. So it hit some of the wealthiest areas in Houston and some of the poorest areas in Houston. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the effect on our social networks. You know, social networks are what make you strong and more resilient, more able to bounce back. So one of the things that we saw in in the immediate aftermath of the storm, when we were in that shelter with 10,000 people, most people can leave because they've got, you know, a sister who lives in a different area and once, you know, they can sort out some transportation, they can go stay with her. Or they've got friends who live on high ground. So for most people, they needed a couple of nights in a shelter and then they could move on and start the long process of recovery. But what we saw is that some people were, really didn't have those strong social networks. They didn't have a place to go. And so some people ended up staying for two, three weeks and then had to transition into longer term sheltering. Um, and it's all the things that make you vulnerable in any case, make you extra vulnerable in the storm. So now I work on long term recovery and how is the city gonna bounce back? How do we use federal resources, state resources, local resources to rebuild housing? Do we need to think about rebuilding in different areas? And as we think about rolling out our home repair program and all these things, we have to really think about people who are vulnerable in any case. And my boss likes to say, you know, some people have hurricanes in their lives before the storm, whether that means you're uh, you're poor or you're disabled, all the things that make it difficult for you to access services or access opportunity before the storm make it extra difficult after the storm. And that's a lot of what we are thinking about right now in the housing department. Who, do we, who can we help? Who do we prioritize um, with the resources that we have? Who's, ha who's having the hardest time? Who's taking the longest to recover? And how do we help them?
Thank you. So everyone is experiencing these superstorms or these extreme events in a very personalized way. And uh, Dr. Maidman told us a story when the panelists were preparing the other day on a phone call. And he was telling us that they were in the response center with no windows, correct? <laughs> and lots of computer screens and lots of people rushing to and fro and trying to analyze this information. But let's go back to no window. <laughs> They couldn't tell if it was raining or sunny outside. They couldn't see anything. So the only observation points they had came from the data and from the models. And so one of the things that's interesting, and um, I think that there are a lot of interesting insights, is this group looks at how do you combine the, the quantitative, um, the hard data, the typical kind of engineering sorts and scientific sorts of information with those softer side and, and more qualitative pieces of information and information. And um, Dr. Maidman presented in his um, talk a little bit about the Facebook group that, that sprung up. So I'd, I'd like to just hear from each of you, uh, you know, what do you think about this crowdsourced information and um, the, the ground truthing? And David, I'd like you to kick that off a little mm -hmm. bit to tell us what your thoughts are. Sure. So when we started the work with the National Water Centre, it seemed to me that the goal was First of all, the federal government is going to reach down to the local area and produce more information, which they have. And so equally, it's our responsibility to reach back and produce more from our own resources so that we can close the loop here. And I think the uh, crowdsourcing and social media and so on are a really good way to do that. Um, and indeed, the method that we developed for the flood mapping just says, if you know the water's already at this level, you can immediately draw a flood map in the local area because you know the height above nearest drainage everywhere. So one of the things that we're now working on is an app that would just say, the water's this high, you know, what's my flood map look like? And, and we want to be able to develop an application that does that. Just on the, on, so I'm gonna push back a little bit about mm -hmm. the, the limits of social networking mm -hmm. in this stuff. Because one of the things we see is that if you don't have a phone that has data or has power, it becomes very difficult for you to use social media, particularly in a disaster. If you're, um, one of my good friends that works for the AARP, the uh, Association of Retired Persons, so older adults, um, real concerns about accessibility. And so when we looked at some of the mapping, uh, there, was a, there was a lot of crowdsourcing about, you know, I need my home mucked and gutted, and can you send volunteers? And it tended to miss people in really poor areas, who some of whom are still living in homes that need to be mucked or gutted. Um, so I think we have to really pay attention to who's using social media and who are we missing when we rely on social media. In the housing department, as we start up these programs for home repair, one of the things we're doing is we gotta send people out into the community. We have to go knock on doors to make sure that we're, miss that we're capturing um, all the people who really need help and not just those who know how to ask for it. Um, I'm going to say, from my perspective, the, the social media and um, crowdsourcing is critical. Um, we had, this is outside of Harvey, but we had an event where one of uh, the counties in, in southeast Texas, Brazoria County, so it's, it's south of Harris, um, we had uh, this, basically this huge flood wave that moved down the Brazos River, and it was south of a gauge that we actually had. The gauge was in the northern part of the county, and all the flooding was occurring in the southern part of the county. And had it not been for this Facebook group that came up with all these ground truth reports of what was actually happening with the Brazos and that portion of the county, we wouldn't have been able to get warnings out. We wouldn't have been able to brief emergency managers. So don't ever underestimate. I mean, we tell this to people a lot in our trainings, but the most important tool you have, you know, whether you're a meteorologist or a scientist, is your eyes because you're actually able to see what's happening. So for me, the, the crowdsourcing is incredibly invaluable. I just add one thing. Please. So we built a, we built a flood model. Um, of what happened during Harvey. Um, some si I am not a scientist, in case you couldn't tell. We hired some scientists to do this for us. And one of the ways that they validated their computer model was with YouTube videos, because people in the storm were posting videos of what was happening around them. Some photographers sent up drones during the storm. So they were able to take what they had done um, with an algorithm or with a formula and then validate it against um, the video from the storm. Point for social media. <laughs> <laughs> yep, the pros and cons of social media. Um, 
<laughs> the uncertainties of social media. And then I'm about to, to tip a pretty tough question over, which is, um, are we really heading into a time of more superstorms, as some people are saying? That's one of the Slido questions that was contributed. So um, I think that's a great question. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're probably seeing there's a, a lot of um, rapid response or quick response studies that are being done to try to attribute the intensity of, of some of the recent events that we've seen um, to, uh, you know, uh, climate change um, or, or, or just different overall trends in, in our, um, our, our, our pattern, our global patterns. Um, so I, I, would, I would have to say that the preliminary modeling that I've seen done for, in terms of hurricane intensities, um, you kind of get these conflicting responses. So I'll, I'll see these studies that come out that talk about, um, yes, like you're going to see more super storms, but we don't really know. The thing that you have to keep in mind is when you're looking at what happens with warmer um, water, if, if we're just talking about hurricane frequency here, um, you have obviously more water vapor because you have more water that's evaporating. So you would think naturally you're going to see an uptick in hurricanes. But if you have these warmer temperatures, then we're going to get a little sciencey with this. So if, if this bothers anyone, just tell me to just... <laughs> dial it back. Uh, but when you have warmer temperatures, it actually takes more water to saturate that air mass. So you actually have to have more water vapor when things are warmer to actually produce clouds. And so some of the things that we've seen from these preliminary studies that are being done um, is that, okay, yeah, so maybe you don't see um, a hurricane season with 20 million hurricanes in it, but maybe you see more intensity with those storms. So you, do, you may not necessarily see an uptick in the number of storms. Um, and this is not an official NOAA forecast or anything. This is just some of the, the research that I've seen that has come out. Um, but basically, you know, maybe you, you begin to see some more intense storms as opposed to an increase in the number of the storms. But this is based on, you know, you're using uh, climate modeling, so you're basically trying to, to take the atmosphere at one point in time and then apply some kind of change to it and then use that as a forecast. Um, so there's, there's still some things to be worked out, and, and maybe Dr. Maidman has looked at, at some of this a little bit more. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a little bit, I feel a little disconcerted about this subject because I've spent 40 years here at the University of Texas teaching students about flood charts, flood frequency. In, in Allison, which happened in 2001, about half of Houston, they had a, a big blob on the map that said, off the charts. And then Harvey, the whole place is off the charts. So, I mean, I get a little concerned. I've been teaching the idea that the past is going to be a good guide to the future for a long period of time. And I'm starting to wonder whether that's still true. And uh, there's, there's no question that the sea level is rising. Uh, the tide gauges are a key indicator of that. And it wouldn't surprise me if in a few years' time we're now starting to plan for the, the rainfall intensities are increasing as well. And I think we should be using the kinds of models that we have now developed, like the National Water Model, for hydrologic design so that we can plan for an increased intensity in the future uh, that maybe the future isn't going to be replicating the past. I think that's the perfect segue. We've got just a few minutes left. I could have sat up here all night, actually. We could keep you up until midnight and keep these, this panel could keep talking. On the phone when, before tonight, it was like wind them up and watch them go. It was awesome. Um, so catch them, catch them when you can for a coffee or a, a, another beverage or, or something because it's fun to talk to this group. Um, but I do want to respect everyone's time and, and make sure that we give you guys a chance just if, if the past has been our key to, to understanding the present and looking to the future, and now we're off the map, so to speak, um, I would really like to hear each of you talk a little bit about, if you could change the future, what's one thing you feel is really critical and important um, that needs to happen in your field of expertise and in the space that you're working in um, on this topic? Yeah, whoever okay. feels ready to go first. <laughs> okay, so um, so I work in policy, and I was I was saying earlier that um, I have a master's degree in international relations, foreign policy, and it wasn't really until I started working in the government that I really understood what policy was. So um, so, but policy is all about making government work for people, and it's the thing I'm most passionate about. 
And here, in experiencing Harvey and the enormous impact that it had on Houston, one of the things that's been very frustrating to see is how chaotic the response is. There's so many different agencies. There's so many different pathways to assist people. We need a more predictable system for how we respond um, in terms of immediate response, what FEMA does, and then all the different agencies and sources of funding that make up the long-term response. In Houston, that's gonna mean billions of dollars, some of it for housing, some of it for infrastructure, but we need a more predictable system so that uh, disaster doesn't become a kind of political football, but really focuses on how do we help the most people and the people who need it most. Great. Um, for me, this is something that we're continuing to grapple with is how do I get each one of you in this room to, to get a warning and, and take action from it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the box that you see drawn on TV, um, but that's still one of the things that I feel like we, we struggle with is, is how do we get people to take action? So that would be the thing that I would change is when you get a piece of warning information, you know what it means, you know what it means to you, and you know what to do with it. And that's a lot to unpack with that. So, but that's, that's what I would want. <laughs> For me, what I would like to see is to be able to see, when we're at the State Operations Centre, a water map across the whole landscape so that in every neighbourhood we could see in the State Operations Centre the situation as the people who are there are seeing it. I mean, there was a situation, especially the first couple of days of Harvey, uh, Houston usually takes care of itself. There are 44,000 firefighters in Houston. Most disasters, they say, we got it, don't worry. But for Harvey, they said, we need help. And so in the State Operations Centre, we we're trying to figure out how, how to get help to Houston. Wh which places are going to be flooded? Which places are dry now but could be flooded later? Uh, do I fly things in from San Antonio? Do I stage in Conroe? Do I stage in Sealy? If I stage in Sealy, how do I get into Houston? How do we interact with the road system? How, where's the water going with respect to the road system? So there were lots and lots of questions like that that we couldn't answer even with the best technologies that we have. And I'd like to be able to think that we could achieve that a better result in the future. I hope, I really hope. Well, with that, I wanna thank each and every one of you, both for the time that you've given the, the, the program tonight and also for the energy and effort that you're putting into your day-to-day -day, um, roles and research and activities. Because thanks for making us all safer. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us, with us all. Um, Jay and Environmental Science Institute, I want to thank you all for hosting another fantastic Hot Science Cool Talk. And to everyone who braved the wet weather, uh, drive safe getting home. And um, thank you for joining us and giving us your time and attention, too. Thank you, David.